good evening, everybody, and I'm thrilled to see such a big audience for another face-to-face -face event. Uh, it's one of our great Frank Davis Memorial Lectures this evening, uh, and these are co-organized by me and my dear friend, Professor Susan Babay, who unfortunately can't be with us. Um, even before I introduce the wonderful Elena Zatseva, I have to hail Frank Davis, this great art critic of country life. Now, I think uh, uh, he would be a little surprised if he knew that Elena was the co-author and editor of Cosmic Shift, Russian Contemporary Art and Writing, and that her subject tonight was about her stories rather than history, history and her stories, women artists and Moscow conceptualism. And I'm proud to say that I've known Elena for quite a few years now, uh, and she's always tantalizing me with her her long biographical story, but because we um, uh, meet at events and at exhibitions and things, I never quite got to the bottom of the fact that Elena, in fact, graduated in 2008 from effectively the Moscow Academy, but the Department of uh, Art History and Theory, already working on the strategies of Moscow conceptualism. She's just told me under a great Tolstoy from the Tolstoy family, Excuse me, it was her PhD. It was when I said graduated, I mean, I've just been in PhD world with my own PhDs upstairs. I mean, properly graduated with a PhD, obviously, uh, on the strategies of Moscow conceptualism. And then, of course, like any good Moscow uh, aspiring curator, she went to Goldsmiths to do an MFA in curating. Uh, but while she was at the Tretiarkov, she curated from 2003 to 7 many notable exhibitions based on the collection, but also uh, an exhibition called, um, what did you say it was called about Russian pop art? Oh yes, Accomplices, my writing is too small, co-curated Accomplices, which sounds very interesting and presumably has borders which interface with what you're going to talk about tonight. Uh, and I wanted to say that, of course, the Courtauld has been very, very um, uh, involved in the study of Moscow conceptualism. A long time ago, in 2011, we did an MA I um, co-ran with the great Boris Groys. His wife, uh, Natalia Nikitin, who's a photographer, with Sabine Hangston, the German uh, art historian and uh, filmmaker who went to Moscow has been the subject of an MA thesis here. And without going into any more of that, we obviously run the Cambridge Courtauld Russian Art Centre and a uh, very much more um, um, provocative uh, offshoot in conjunction with C's called Perverting the Power Vertical, something very topical tonight. But we're going to talk about women today. Um, his story and her stories, Women Artists in Moscow Conceptualism. I was going to talk about one or two women artists of Moscow Conceptualism I had brushes with, but I think it would be more interesting and more informative if I give the floor straight to Elena Zatseva. So congratulations on this, Elena. And I'm so very pleased you're talking at last at the court order. And I know to a very large international audience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah, for such a wonderful introduction. I am really, really pleased uh, and honored to be here at Kultal. And thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm, I, I'm really delighted to talk about my subject, uh, Women in Russian Art, today. This lecture is a part of my ongoing research in role of women in Russian art, modern and contemporary, that I started in 2018 during my fellowship at the Garage Museum of Contemporary Art in Moscow, working in the wonderful archives of contemporary art, visiting studios and talking, taking interviews with the artists, female as, as well as male. The topic of role of women artists in Soviet Union is large. There were very accomplished, outstanding women artists in Russia since the beginning of the 20th century when the generation of the Amazons of um, Russian avant-garde emerged. After the Second World War, the very strong women artists on both sides of official and non-official art division worked. Although the position of women artists and the conditions of the work were different on two different sides of that division between official and non-official. The non-official art in the Soviet Union from 1960s until the end of the 1980s is well researched. 
and there are many books published on it. Exhibitions were held, collection displays, ac displays accomplished, in particular in Russia. And yet, when reading books in post-war art history, one can see a very few, if any, names of women artists from Russia, still. And I don't want to victimize these women. They all are very accomplished artists, each of whom created an impressive body of works. They uh, influenced the other artists, male and female. Many of them got catalogues and exhibitions that are represented in, in the museum collections. And yet, the books of history of art of that dream barely mention them. Why is it so? Is the history of art still written by men about men in the 21st century? Today we are going to look at the history of only one period of non-official art in the Soviet Union, Moscow conceptualism, from the feminist perspective. My task today is swing the pendulum of art history towards women to show their achievements. As you know, Moscow conceptualism was a very vibrant circle of artists that produced not only an impressive body of artworks, works driven by passion to understand what the true art is, uh, but also it produced rich and intense discourse, which in fact brought this art beyond the movement. Uh, Moscow conceptualism was a, a proto-institution that allowed um, contemporary art emerge, to emerge in Russia after the Perestroika. The richness, uh, the richness and intensity of the text produced by the artists of Moscow conceptualism fascinate the researchers, but often this fascination becomes an obstacle to understand the history in an objective way. Moscow conceptualism had its hierarchies. There have been leaders such as Andrei Monastirsky, the leader of Collective Action Group, Ilya Kabakov, a great artist whose studio was a center of gravitation for artists, poets, and musicians. And this circle had their hierarchies. The hierarchies of the compact circle of artists were quite elaborated and strong. They penetrated into fabric of artworks, and they were explored by means of art. Uh, you can see it clearly if you read the dictionary of terms of Moscow Conceptual School. In art movement, uh, any art movement needs structure. In particular, uh, an art movement in the Soviet Union, uh, surrounded by uh, official culture and by censorship. Um, uh, and in particular, you, need, you probably need hierarchies in conceptual art, art which uh, explores the very uh, prestigious that make art art. And this was reflected in the rich body of text produced by the members of the circle. The researchers, attracted by the richness of these texts, repre reproduce the hierarchy uh, implied in them without maintaining the critical distance to, the, to their primary sources. Um, uh, but these primary sources are really talentedly written. Uh, I, being young researcher doing my PhD in Moscow, was absolutely fascinated with texts by Ilya Kabakov, by uh, books um, by um, Nikita Alexeyev, uh, Andrei Monastirsky, who was a wonderful poet, text by Joseph Bakstein, Yuri Albert, Vadim Zaharov. And I should say I didn't take them critically either, but we shouldn't reproduce the same narratives. So today I'm trying to swing the pendulum and try to tell the history slightly different. Um, I decided to break my narrative into, into five chapters. So first chapter, I don't complain about anything. I don't complain about anything, and I like everything, even though I've never been here and I don't know anything about these parts, says the text on the banner. What I'm looking at is the iconic work um, of Moscow conceptualism. The photo photograph of this red banner, stretched in the snowy woods near Moscow in January 1977, by Collective Action Group is arguably the best known work of Moscow conceptualism, made in a style of impersonal propaganda slogans that, that predict Soviet cities uh, of late communism, yet transmitting a reflective individualistic lines from a poetry book by Andrei Monastirsky, and transmitting a, uh, sorry, 
um, and placed in the woods of a river bank away from Moscow, this work is a masterpiece of non-official art of 1970s. A quiet yet bold intervention, a part of empty action strategy that disrupted authoritarian aesthetics in a nonchalant and witty manner. It is clever, funny, ironic, and refers to much mass propaganda, but appeals to intellectuals. Like many other works by the collective actions crew, the work is signed with the names of individual artists, Andrei Monastersky, Vera Naturich Hlebnikova, Nikita Alexeyev, Georgi Kirivater, Nikolai Pudnikov, MK, and Andrea Brown. The order of the names reflects on the impact of each artist in creating the work. Two of them are women. Close to the end of the list is MK, Maria Konstantinova, who was trained as a painter, but she stitched this banner as she stitched every single prom for uh, trips to countryside by collective action crew. Vera Mitorich Hlebnikova, second from the top of the list, was the artist who suggested and insisted that the banner should be a red color, color red. Originally, the idea of Andrei Monastersky, the leader of the group and the leader for this particular work, was uh, that the banner should be white. Red color brought so many dimensions to work. It brought the social dimension and dimension of humor. This carnivalesque juxtaposition of high and low languages appeals to any spectator, to one who are prepared to encounter a conceptual artwork, which were very few at the time, and the one whose optics are tuned to a different, more maybe simple kind of message. This work is very democratic, and this is an important point. The attention to people who don't belong to the highly intellectual circles of artists of Mos in Moscow and at the same time, rejection to patronize them was a significant part of Vera Flemnikova's strategy. We will return to her works later. This photograph by the artist Georgi Kizivalta, a, a member of Collective Action Group, roughly shows the atmosphere in which the ideas of first trips to countryside by the Collection Action Group were born. And this is the portrait of Vera Hlebnikova and Andrei Monastersky at their home in early 1980s. You see very creative atmosphere, artworks on the walls. At the same time, what you see here is an iconography of a family, which was a very typical for, Soviet, for late Soviet time. A man contemplating ideas, positioning himself horizontally on the uh, city, and a woman with a straight back knitting a jumper for a man uh, being involved in effective labor. This iconography brings us straight to the topic of feminist women in the Soviet Union. These are reprints of Samizdat Journal, which was, according to one of its authors, Tatiana Gorichova, the first democratic journal in our city, the city of Leningrad. Women in Russia, an almanac to women about women, was co-edited by Korycheva at Tatiana Mamonova and published in 10 copies in 1979, typed and bound by hand. The almanac was given an overview of life of women in the USSR, talking about them, carrying about a, a double burden of a career and effective labors, and about more acute problems such as home, home violence, abortions, oppressive attitudes in medical institutions, a cruelty in women's prisons. We provided a platform for all women, skilled and unskilled workers, housewives, students, and farmers. From the beginning, we have represented the mass women's movement and not an elite group, wrote Tatiana Mamonova, a co-editor of the Almanac. Half, uh, half of the articles of Almanac were articles, another half were creative writing, the stories, uh, short stories, and poems, two of them touched on LGBT TMP. The reaction of the authorities were quick and sharp. They confiscated the materials for the second issue and sent the editors to the exile. It happened on the second day of Moscow Olympics uh, in, 19, uh, in July 1980. The three women were put on a plane, almost empty plane, in full color and flown to Vienna. Here you see them 
on the screen uh, just after they uh, landed. Uh, on the left, uh, from the left, this is Tatiana Mamonova uh, with her son, uh, Natalia Malachowska, Tatiana Goricheva, and Yulia Vesnysenska, who was already uh, in exile after she spent some time in the Gulag for, for her publications. Although Mamonova and Goricheva uh, published the journal together, their platforms were different. Mamonova, a poet and an artist who fluently read English and French, read as a student uh, The Second Sex by Simone de Beauvoir in the original. Uh, she was well read in Western feminism and believed that all women of Russia would be emancipated by means of feminist education. Goricheva is a philosopher. She wrote a PhD thesis on German philosophy. She was exchanging letters with Martin Heidegger, a philosopher who was very important for conceptual artists. She probably was the only person in the Soviet Union to whom Heidegger wrote letters. Tatiana Goricheva mentions in one of her interviews that she turned to feminism because she was tired of haughtiness of snobbish dissident culture of Leningrad. She wanted to be useful to real people, their people. At the moment, she was co-editing a journal uh, titled 37, a journal of poetry and critique with her husband, Victor Krivoli. One of the authors of 37 was Boris Groys, regular authors of 37, a first theorist of Moscow conceptualism, who coined the name Moscow Romantic Conceptualism. Goetje also was a leader of a Christian feminist group, Maria. She believed that in Russia, women shouldn't follow the Western liberal feminism. Their social conditions and their history were different, she said. They had to develop a sense of dignity and liberate themselves through their Christian faith. That could lift them above the ugly social patterns of patriarchy. Actually, the relations of oppression were mm -hmm. quite often described like joyless matriarchal analyzing uh, gender relationships in Russia. She believed that the problems of exhaustion of the spirit deprived both women and men from their freedom and wouldn't allow them to mature in responsible and nurturing relationships. She was very critical uh, to pursue the equality of men and women um, declared by Soviet constitution, describing women as slaves of slaves, and saying that it is not only women who suffer, but the men are getting weaker and weaker in a society that claimed equality, equality of gender, but unable to grant basic freedoms to its members. One is not born as a woman, wrote Goetje, one has to become a woman. Well, she apparently quotes Simone de Beauvoir here. And this is extremely difficult in our society, as our society is not society of men and women, it is a society of hermaphrodites. Contrary to Mamonova, she didn't believe that emancipation could be, caused, could be caused by equality. She was saying that men and women should be allowed to be different, not equal, and make their own choices. At the moment, she argued, what she saw uh, in Russia was existential paralysis of men and in Paris, Goricheva developed her theory of feminism in Almanac de Silva. Uh, for this, um, uh, one of the regular uh, contributors to Beseda was Boris Groys as well. So, feminism was in the focus of intense discussions of, in dissident circles of the late 1970s and early 80s in Russia. But there were no feminist movements in art. Actually, the art world was a target of dissident feminist critique. This is what Tatiana Mamunova wrote a few years after she published the first almanac. The dissident artists present themselves as non-conformists only in their art. In their attitude towards women, they are absolutely conformists. Like many other men in the Soviet Union, they have not grasped the feminist movement, that the feminist movement is directed not against men, but against the violation of the person in any manner, by any purpose. Margarita Topitsyn, an international creator who emerged from the circles of Moscow conceptualism, wrote that texts of feminists were reaching the artists at the time. 
However, feminist text didn't resonate to non-official non artists. She concludes that there were so few women in Moscow conceptualism that defining it as a, as a feminist, defi defining themselves as feminist would, um, would uh, put them in the position of double marginal. But basically, there were, there were quite, quite a few, few women in Moscow conceptualism, and many of them were looking at, at the themes of feminism and uh, uh, providing feminist critique. One of the sources that informed Moscow conceptualism were experiments of futurists of the beginning of the 20th century. Here you see the reconstruction of the work made in 1919 by Pyotr Miturich. Uh, the work itself was a reflection to the star alphabet by Vladimir Klebnikov. The work was reconstructed by Vera Miturich Klebnikov and Maya Miturich. Cubes represent regular and abstract structure of the grid in 3D. In her seminal essay, Grid, uh, Rosalind Krauss claimed that the grid functions to declare the modernity of modern art. Departing from this point, Margarita Pitson, in the essay, The Grid as a Checkpoint of Modernity, wrote, in Western art, his, in Western art history, the grid has been positioned as an emblem of modernism. In Russia, however, early constructivist artists saw the grid as both a formal and ideological device. After a period dominated by socialist realism, the grid was readopted in the 1960s and 70s by some dissident modernist and conceptualist artists. Rima Girlovina was the first artist to, to do so. Poet Sevalin Nikrasov anecdotically claimed her a grandmother of uh, Moscow conceptualism, although uh, she was much younger than him. Uh, an artist, Boris Arvov, said, said that Girlovins were the first who implemented the world concept in our circle. Nobody pronounced it before them. And Margarita Dupitson says, at the beginning of 1970s, the most significant conceptualist was Rima Girlovin, who was seen producing some work objects every time we were visiting the studio of Valery Girlovin. Valery wasn't conceptual, conceptualist back uh, then yet. He was a painter. All this extract uh, I, I took from the book, the book uh, called Beginning of Moscow Conceptualism, uh, collected and edited by Yuri Albert. So I'll show you a few works by Rima Kirlovin. This, uh, this is the interactive works. You can take the cube, open it, and take another cube from it. So this cube says, uh, you cogitate, I exist, reflection of on Kovita Ergo Su. Uh, this says, do not, this says, spirit, the spirit, don't open, don't open or it fly away. And when you open it, you see here, it flew away. Bird sees that the world is in a cage, the work 1974, um, which became uh, an inspiration for a performance by Grimm and Valery Girlovin. Called Homo sapiens, where when the artists were sitting in a cage naked uh, in, the, in the studio. This uh, photograph was represented on so called uh, biennial of dissidents in uh, Venice in 1977. Rima and Valery Girlovin costumes. This is a classical conceptual artwork. Similar to Kosos 1 and 3 chess, this work questions different ways of representation. Uh, what we can see here is a costume of a gender bodies that covering the body itself. And uh, a photograph of, of this. But, the, but there were no, unlike the Kosos work, which were hung in the gallery, exploring representation artworks, uh, exploring what, what does make 
uh, an object, an artwork. Um, they didn't have the gallery, so they went to the open field to explore Rashidius. What, what, what does, to the question, what does make art art? Actually, uh, the, the text, first, first time, text by Corset, the art after philosophy, Moscow artists read in the translation by this artist, Nadezhda Stavrovskaya. Here you see her at your home again uh, with her husband, Yuri Albert. Uh, Nadezhda Stavrovskaya um, was part of the small, small circus uh, of Stavrovskaya, uh, Zaharov and Albert, who were kind of part of the bigger circus, circle, circle, circle circle of Moscow conceptualism. Stolpovska, uh, as uh, both Zaharov and Albert recount, found her art language very early, earlier than both of them. And she, already at like 18, she exactly knew exactly what she wants to do as an artist. She took lessons from Ekaterina Arnold, uh, who, who was uh, a modernist, uh, artist, a wife of um, Alexander Ivanov, uh, and this is how they got into the bigger circles of conceptualists. The method of, um, of Stolkovska were again uh, based on modernist greed. Uh, this is her uh, work in the, in the collaboration with Vadim Zaharov. Uh, there was a series of works where, um, where uh, the artists were intently making works in collaboration. But basically she worked, she worked um, independently and she was applying a modernist greed, but kind of trying to extract uh, figurative meaning in this, in this um, modernist greed. And for example, this work is called uh, Table Clothes, Table Cover for the Table Clothes. These are stones, red current, grand solar clock, the plant in grand solar clock, melon in the market, Uzbekistan, and street in Uzbekistan. This is Yuri Albert uh, showing works by. Nadezhda Stolkovska, many of her works are interactive. Again, interactive, again, you have to open the flap, so unfold something or open something. You have to interact with artworks. Uh, I put his book, uh, book by Yuri Albert, assembled and, and edited by um, Yuri Albert, uh, Moscow Conceptualist, the beginning, because it was a really good source for me um, of, of, of actually understanding how the Moscow um, uh, began, although there were only two interviews with women uh, in that book, and only one of these women is an artist. Uh, and this is, this is basically a version how Moscow conceptualists uh, began uh, in Moscow, but there are some, um, there is some, there is a version supported by some other artists that uh, conceptualism existed even early in Russia, somewhere between Sverdlovsk and Taganrog, where artists um, uh, from so-called Urtusk group, Urtus group lived. Here you see Anna Tarshis with uh, Sergei Sigai, members of that group. This is the wedding photograph. And Natasha's, uh, uh, yeah, uh, Ut Utkus, uh, Utkus School was also published in some of that journal called The Number. Uh, Anna Tarshis is a very interesting uh, figure. She is a poet. Uh, she, uh, graduated, she studied at Leningrad uh, Institute of Cin Cinematography for two years, and then she was expelled for formalism. There is an anecdote that her tutor said her, uh, she, she didn't want to learn actually the system of realistic representation. So her tutor once told her that it's even uh, 
it's even possible to teach a hare to light matches. And she answered, I'm not a hare, I'm a wolf. <laughs> and uh, she's quite, quite, you see, quite, quite petite and a uh, uh, young woman. So she said, I'm a wolf. And she chosen, um, chosen a pen name, Ri, uh, Ri Nikonova. Ri is like Rome sound of uh, an angry animal. Uh, so she um, uh, wrote uh, concrete poetry, and then she invented vacuum poetry. This is, uh, which, which was in fact performance. This is uh, here. She she is performing uh, her vacuum poem, which is stripes of paper stretched in the frame, and she <coughs> plays with it with uh, with soft soft movements of her hand with razor blade in it. She gradually cuts the stripes until all the, all the stripes come to the side of the frame. So in fact, uh, she, she was one of the first performers um, in, in uh, conceptual art in Russia. In 19... In 1974, Anna Tarsus and Sergei Segun moved to Anna's uh, birth city, Yeysk, where um, it, it is a resort town on south of Russia, on Azov Sea. And the houses were quite a uh, quite, um, um, attractive place for artists from Moscow. See, here you see uh, Dmitry Prigov is uh, reading uh, in, in the garden of uh, house of uh, Tarsus and Segun. And this is um, this poets were kind of researched very recently. This is the stills of the performance, uh, performance uh, lecture uh, that, that took place in Moscow in Vesnesensky section. <coughs> Poetry and performance were inseparable for Russia. Performances by the collective action group were in fact <coughs> developments from concrete poetry. Andrei Monastirsky, in aforementioned book Moscow Conceptualism Beginning, says that he came to art from the poetry. In 1972, he wrote a collection of surrealist poems. And then, step by step, under the influence of Elizaveta Mazakanova, another female poet, uh, who influenced him and uh, uh, other artists of the circle, for example, Leo Rubinstein also uh, liked her very much. Uh, so through formalism, he moved to text structures, then to objects and performances. He wrote, Mlatakanova shown us a new other type of creating the text in poetry, more structured, contextual spheres. Text was always primal. Even actions usually were developed from the word that came as it might be. On the screen, you see documentation of the performance ball of 15th of June 1977 that was first imagined as a picture of a gigantic ball, four meters in diameter, that would flow down the river Klezma with the electric bell turned inside it. The ball was sown overnight by Maria Konstantinovna. She was also among the handful of very committed artists who were blowing balloons by their sheer breath for six hours under the pouring rain before they just let the ball go. Here you see Maria Konstantinova uh, on this photograph on the right uh, in the studio of Ilya Kabakov, surrounded by your peers, uh, Andrei Monastirsky, Ilya Kabakov himself, uh, Viktor Skersis, uh, Nikita Alexeyev, Leo Rubinstein, and Yelena Yelakina. Helena Hilagina was another is uh, Helena Hilagina is another very important part of uh, collective actions. She is, in fact, a key member of it. Uh, here you see her with Igor Mikhailovich, uh, her partner, uh, performing uh, uh, on the action place called Place of Action in 1979. And this is the um, the performance, again, the action called to Yelena Gilagina by collective action groups, which was um, 
performance based on manipulations with the photograph that Elena Yanagina taken. And on the roof of the car, uh, which is uh, at some point will start to move, on the roof of the car you see an artist, Sabina Hengsky. She was a woman with a movie camera. She was the only, uh, only uh, member of the group who had video camera. Uh, she uh, basically, at the time in Soviet Union, uh, cameras were under control. People couldn't just carry cameras around and use them. So she, it took her quite a lot of effort to actually bring camera across the border from Germany. She, she is German. And she came to Moscow to study Russian language first, and then came again as a researcher. Um, of Russian culture, and she won a grant at the Geek Moscow, Moscow Institute of Cinematography, and uh, uh, that's why she can prove, she could prove to the authorities that she she can carry camera around. So, because of Sabina Hengskin, we've got really good um, documentations, video documentations of a collective action group. Group we wouldn't have them without them. They were. Mm, I think they are still shown, uh, one of the films is still shown in collective, uh, collection display of the tape model. So, chapter three, a room of one's own. Here you see taught art group. A duo, Natalia Avalakova and Anatoly Zhigalov worked and lived together. They claimed that everything what they do is art, therefore the name, taught art. So totality of their of they life was art. So when they had a child, they claimed it their best, their best piece of art. So this is the work officially called the best, the best piece by us. Uh, this artist creative created a very, very interesting image of the kitchen. There were the artists who, who were exploring a uh, feminist agenda in the work. Uh, so, symbolic image of Russian art, I call it. Uh, Russian art was happening mostly in the kitchens. So, the oven, the oven here is called the Vodka, which is spiritual. The table with the curtain, ironically, called sacred and a dustbin, a turtle. This work is usually interpreted as an ironic recollection of non-conceptualist, non-official art that was preoccupied with the themes of spirituality and eternal. Looking on this kitchen from the feminist perspective, we can see that the social pattern it represents is far from the ones that represented restrictive enclosures of Western women within the circle of kitchen, church, and nursery. Soviet kitchens comprised semantics of the whole world. They were so much more bigger. They were like window into the world rather than enclosure for women. There was a work that explored um, the theme of sexuality um, in socialist construct by uh, a group. This performance, floor polishing, took place in Abalakov and Jagalov flat in Moscow, and it was dedicated to the 20th anniversary of Duchamp's work at Antonin. Mm -hmm. It's actually so interesting, it's so close to only 20 years uh, of Duchamp, Duchamp, Duchamp's work back then. Uh, the work at Antonin by Duchamp. Uh, you, of course, remember uh, it. It's basically uh, the viewers were uh, invited to uh, peer into the holes in the screen, uh, and behind the screen there was very explicitly sexualized image of women, uh, women's body. So uh, the artist invited uh, friends, and peers, to the performance, where they had to look in the peer in the hole in the in the screen that was uh, clo closing uh, the living room of the artists. And what the 
the guests could see is two artists polishing the floors. They were getting hold out of hard labor and undressing gradually and slowly. But they never actually, they never fully undressed. They never satisfied the expectations of, of, the, of the guests. This, this work is a kind of the subject matter of polishing floors refers to Russian avant-garde. There are very well-known works by Malevich and Kanchelovsky on this uh, subject matter. Really beautiful works. So it's kind of, uh, it's, it's reference, it's, it's got this work, by this work they say, yeah, it's a homage to Duchamp, but we actually had in our history something even more important than Duchamp. And also from the feminist perspective, you could clearly see that it is a metaphor of sexuality in, in the Soviet Union, where kind of labor replaces jouissance. A man and a woman polishing the floor would never satisfy the expectations of the, of the guests. They kind of never, never, never undress. As many conceptual artists in Russia, Natalia Avalakova is a writer. She is an author of many theory texts. In one of them, she explores the question why there were no feminist movement in non-official art of Russia. Her argument is, our history, she writes, hasn't requested men to constrain their wives within the kitchen, nursery, and church. On the other hand, women voluntarily followed their male partners to gulag, communal dwellings, or immigration. Maybe because of that, Russian women artists are rather collaborators of the men, rather than competitors. She also says, Russian women spent most of the 20th century in the trenches of different kinds. Therefore, it would be reasonable to expect some gender limitations. In one of my articles, I argue that installations by Irina Noho, in particular her rooms, have strong dimension of feminist critique. Her rooms occupy a momentous place in the history of Moscow conceptualism. Beginning during the cold, dark, wet, and frustratingly long winter of 1982 and 3 in February, Noho created five different installations of room in her apartment, apartment over five consecutive years. Each time it was in February. Each installation was made in the winter. And she, she says, I started doing things out of extreme necessity before I even knew the term installation. It was the start of 1980s, the Brezhnev era. It felt that everything was over and nothing could ever change, wrote the artist. By the time she spent 10 years uh, as an artist. She was a mature artist, but there were no any opportunities to exhibit. So the room of her apartment was emptied of domestic objects and turned into a space with white walls uh, with specialist lighting. She invited the uh, theater light lighting designer who brought uh, very powerful lamps that were blinding, uh, kind of naked. The guest hidden blind. So she recreated white cubes on institution in her apartment in Moscow. This, this is a photograph of her in the room number one. This is room number two, which was um, reconstructed in Tate London a few, few years ago. In the dialogues of Andrei Monastersky with Joseph Buckstein, Monastersky recounts that the creation of each room by Nahova was a significant event in the life of conceptual circus in Moscow. Her rooms, he said, shook the community as no other work by any other artist. Here she is uh, uh, in, in her room number two. Uh, the second uh, file of uh, Moscow Archive of New Art was dedicated totally to the rooms. I will read a few excerpts from the discussions published there. Joseph Buckstein says, The viewer was stepping in the space of intense aesthetic sensation. 
Andrei Monastirsky. What is done by Irina is the huge event. He uses four, say, vowels in the, in the uh, word event. Sabiti, say, in Russian. By means of her work, she recreated eventfulness of our artistic life as it is as if she has shaken our circles. And Eduard Garachowski, the painter, says, we got into the painting, and now we know what the painting is from the painting. Ilya Kabakov, from the photo, he's here with Joseph Buckstein, uh, writes, I, I'm, I'm quoting him, Yes, yes, this is strong, this is wonderful, authentic, this is really authentic art. Everything what Ira does in this relation is genie. He started to say the word genius, but then he stopped and uh, swapped for marvelous, for more female word, uh, word, marvelous. Then he continues, absolutely blind, visceral action, enormous energy, power, I have to say that I'm stunned by its design for its power, its integrity. It has emerged and it's real. It is there, says Kabakov. And so Kabakov acknowledges the ingenuity, authenticity, and visceral power of Irina Nakhova's work. This installation was inspired by an album from the family archive of Nakhova. Uh, that shows the destruction of Alexander Nevsky Cathedral in Moscow that was destroyed yeah, using explosives uh, by orders of Stalin in the 1930s. So she managed to reconstruct this uh, feeling of power, of explosion and destruction. Interesting that when Ilya Kovakov entered the first installation, first installation of the rooms. He criticized uh, Nahava uh, for lack of social critique. He work, uh, but actually, uh, that was right. Her, her, her work didn't come from a place of social critique. Her work came from the place of feminine subjectivity. Women, when frustrated, often find solace in the home, in changing their home. Uh, Nahava put it in the words, I started doing things out of extreme necessity. It, it quite often happens with a femin feminist critique that it comes from the point of subjectivity and then goes far beyond the personal matters. Uh, Nahava's work was addressing the institutional situation. Moscow conceptualists were working as if in imagining and idealized Western art institution in the situation of the impossibility of such an institution, which Nahava articulated by recreating a white cube in her small central Moscow apartment. Uh, better of all, this uh, critique of white cube uh, rendered in this room number three, uh, which was uh, which was built first in 1985 and then rebuilt in 2000. Zimmerman uh, Museum by the creator Jane Sharp. Uh, what what Nahava did? She she uh, cleared the uh, cleared the room from the domestic uh, objects, and then again she put white uh, paper on the walls and the floor, and uh, and then she put a bright lamp in the corner, and uh, the bright lamp uh, was still still. There were shades in the room. There were certain objects left that were cast in shades. So these shades were drawn by the artist. So the shades were real, but at the same time, they were drawn. So the uh, spectator entering this room, they kind of didn't quite understand, are they in real space with the shades, or they in the drawn space of the shades? So this is, again, a metaphor of stepping into the into totally artificial space. So now from from the uh, this kind of, this uh, narrative of feminist critique in uh, works of women of 
Moscow conceptualism. We're going to actually the first exhibition, the first feminist exhibition that was organized in that circle. The exhibition called Woman Walk, Rabotnitsy. It was held in L Gallery in September 1990, curated by Yelena Selina and Anna Alchuk, who was um, in fact the, the soul of this and the leader of this exhibition. This is this here you see the poster of the exhibition that has names of the artists who participated in it. Anna Alchuk, Yelena Yulagina, Maria Konstantinova, Vera Mutovich Klebnikova, Elena Mahova, Sabina Henskin, and Elena Shakovskaya. Anna Alchuk, here you see the, her report about, about her activity as an artist from again the focus uh, of Moscow Archive of New Art. Uh, was a talented poet, activist, and one of the first theorists of feminism in post-Soviet Russia who were exploring specific gender configurations of historical socialist and post-socialist -post societies. For, the, for this exhibition, she made the work um, appropriating a propaganda poster of uh, Stalin's time, revealing uh, the phallic nature of the Stalin's power that blurred the gender divisions in that population, who, independent of, of, the, of the real gender, were kind of were tending to become figure of feminine um, in relation to just one big male figure of Stalin. Uh, she revealed this semantics in Soviet posters. But Alchuk's role uh, for this exhibition uh, went beyond uh, creating work and creating it. She created a community of artists with feminist agenda, most who were uh, exploring it further in the works, and we will see these works. Uh, Irina Nahova has got wonderful recollection of, uh, of this uh, preparation of the exhibition. I'm quoting her. She wrote, Exhibition Women Worker was created by women creators and women artists in the atmosphere of hopes, expectations, and high spirits. I will never forget that feeling of playfulness, openness to collaboration and festive mood. My best friend, the artist Alena Shekhovskaya, was happy to participate in our project Secret. We have buried her painting in the ground under the glass, like a little secret children play. And the public very carefully were discovering them, clearing the sand with brushes. Uh, like, I don't know whether people played this game, in children, played this game in this country, but in the Soviet Union we played little secrets when we were putting some, I don't know, like uh, wraps uh, uh, of chocolates and little objects under the glass and hiding it under the glass and then opening it. So that, that kind of gesture was reconstructed by Irina Nahova and uh, Ilyana Shekhovskaya. Uh, so the, uh, the guests should discover the paintings uh, covered by Irina uh, Nahova. Uh, another artist who participated in this exhibition is Vera Mitovich Klebnikova. Uh, you see her work on the screen. She says that the start of feminist circles became formative for her and actually um, important impetus for her art. Very important um, for all participants were regular meetings on which they discussed the prospective exhibitions. Uh, Hlebnikova even uh, says, says that she first left uh, her 12 year old daughter at home on her, on her own because it was important for her to go to this meeting, meeting with the other artists. Uh, so she compared, uh, Hlebnikova compares these meetings with collective actions group discussions, though. She says that collective action group discussions were retrospective. There were discussions uh, of works that already happened. But feminist meetings were looking into the future. So, Vera Hlevnikov, in the focus of her strategy, put the notion of care. But it is not a domestic care. The care 
it's the careful memories of people, unknown and unnamed, common people, people of different parts of Russian society and history, from aristocrats of the time before the revolution uh, to farmers and workers of the Soviet time. In focus of her concern are archives of people whose memory she tries to rescue from the oblivion. She uh, asks people to bring her archives. Sometimes she really rescues archives who were thrown into, into the dustbins. And she creates great works like this album of photographs that comprises photographs of uh, kind of all street and all status of Russian societies. They're all old photographs made uh, before, just few years before, few years after of Russian Revolution. Uh, this photograph is actually the copy of this album is in Washington Museum of Women. She takes objects that look insignificant and gives them close attention and significance by assembling them in exhibited artworks. Uh, for the exhibition uh, Rabotnice, she actually uh, made work called Love and Cops, which is based on a short story by, uh, by uh, uh, an amateur woman who published her short story in the local newspaper, like very local newspaper, and, uh, and um, she just got fascinated with the story, I would retell it for me to retell it, but it's uh, it's very kind of unusual story and very kind. So she created work to kind of bring this this uh, story into kind of into the attention of of the public who wouldn't read it uh, in this tiny newspaper. Um, so. Um, This is a very interesting work. These are, um, this, this is a silk screen. You can see the scale of it. Sil silk screen of stamps that you found in a small uh, tin of uh, sweets called Mont uh, there, there are stamps, with uh, post stamps that were stamped in many different towns of Russia, many different cities of Russia. Practically, you could see all geography of Russia of the time around the Russian Revolution. She says some of the stamps actually were made before the revolution, others are after. So kind of this this work comprises so much of Russian history so and, and geography at the same time. This is her recently in her studio and in Moscow. And her recent work, um, again, on the theme of memory, you see these little stones uh, that uh, uh, chicken goats, you call them, uh, which, um, which people collect on the beach for some memories. So this uh, kind of anthropomorphic figure is burdened with these memories. You could see like its metaphor of burden of the memory, burden, burden of the work, hard work of rescue memory. With, with us. And the climax, cl climax of your work uh, with um, other people's memory uh, came into the novel she wrote and published uh, in Alite, uh, in publishing house in Moscow in 2002. Uh, this is uh, the, uh, the novel that comprises letters and diary entries from. Uh, from just people, uh, including children, young people, officers, uh, scientists, uh, from uh, who lived like in 1920s, 1930s in Russia. There are letters with many, some of them with many grammatical grammatical uh, mistakes. But there were absolutely when you read it, it recreates absolutely stunning picture of life. Uh, and mindset of the whole country, and she she weaved it in the fictional story, uh, and the story was that a woman uh, was asked uh, to write a letter by a man who who hasn't seen her for twenty years, to describe how she lived in this twenty years, and then uh, when she wrote this very very long letter, 
in which he included this uh, letters of, by other people and diaries, uh, where she pressed to the wrong button and uh, her own letter was deleted and turned into some strange symbols and only a few lines left from which you can reconstruct it without helping you, but very vaguely. Uh, but all letters are intact. So it's absolutely beautifully structured uh, history that comprises so many personal histories of people whom you, you would never know about otherwise. Uh, this is the work of uh, another, another participant of the Robert Walker exhibition, Maria Konstantinova, our heroine who uh, stitched all the prompts of collective action groups. This is uh, her work early 90s uh, called Order of the Red Star and you see that it's kind of in a, in a quite funny way uh, the star uh, turns into gendered female body. Uh, one of her works uh, is actually, actually dedicated to uh, to Kazimir Manevich. It's called KM to MK because her initials is mirroring uh, the initials of, of uh, Manevich. This is the reconstruct reconstruction of the original work of 1990. Uh, Anna Alchuk made very interesting work where she posed um, together with uh, another artist. She posed with uh, a male artist. She posed um, in the same poses, dressed up uh, identically. And create, uh, they created this kind of, um, pairs of photographs, uh, like typical, typical uh, photographs of a woman and typical photographs uh, of a man. And after they taken the photographs, they noticed that every time they were portraying a woman, you see, a woman and man portraying a woman, or a woman and man portraying men. Uh, every time they were portraying a man, a man was doing something, working. Uh, and every time they were portraying a woman, she was either laying on a sofa or sitting, and she was passive. And a man was always active. Uh, another participant of uh, the uh, Woman Walk exhibition, Irena Vilagina, we saw her, uh, her work today already as part of the collective action group, uh, worked uh, with her critique, worked uh, with gender stereotypes, how they reflect in the language. This work, uh, wonderful, plays with the uh, with, uh, the fact that in Russian language, wonderful or beautiful has got the same root as color red. And later on, she developed this. This is actually one of, I think it's one of the very few images that uh, you could find original images from that exhibition of 1990. Uh, later, a decade later, she developed it in, into kind of more crisp form. It's again the same word, uh, wonderful, beautiful. That, uh, but the root red uh, turns into kind of kitchen, kitchen um, reference. And again, you see, this is not the kitchen. This is already not the kitchen that was kitchen of uh, uh, of Soviet time, like not the window to the wall. This is the neoliberal kitchen. This is kitchen of enclo that encloses woman into restrictive uh, relations, restrictive social patterns. Unfortunately, uh, well, philosopher Katie Chukro, in her recent book, Practicing the Good, Desire and Border in Soviet Socialism, says, when it comes to researching the issue of gender in former socialist societies, one soon stumbles upon a stereotype common in the post-Cold War era, that the lexicons of emancipation in communist socialist societies could be the same as those in the West, if only they could be considered separate from ideological regulations imposed on those societies by their bureaucratic apparatus. So, uh, Chukhrov believes that we should find 
uh, we should find a different language. And, uh, and uh, also she believes that Russia could find uh, uh, feminism uh, and Russian emancipation could find different different cause from liberal cause. Unfortunately, it didn't it didn't happen. This is another work by uh, Elena Gilagina, the laboratory of great uh, doing. Uh, this work um, dedicated uh, to Olga Lipishinska, a very famous scientist. Uh, again, uh, Gilagina had a lot of materials uh, in her, uh, about uh, Lipishinska somehow in her family archive. So, based on archive uh, research, she created this work. Uh, Lipishinska was um, a science, scientist who uh, had enormous amount of accolades uh, she received from Stalin, but actually she wasn't even trained how to conduct research, uh, scientific research. She made a scientific career by means of, kind of uh, using her, um, her uh, uh, administrative resources. Uh, but she was incredibly popular because she claimed that she discovered the life essence that could allow people to live until like 300 years <laughs> old. Uh, and they believed, and, and she, she managed to wrap it up in some scientific words. So many, many believed, the most important are her authorities believed. But unfortunately, it, it, really, uh, it really was quite a tragic story uh, because the, uh, the real scientists, they couldn't do what they meant to do. And it was quite tragic. Uh, and their lives were broken because of that. So here you see, again, this picture of Jordan's matriarchate that was, that was uh, kind of part of Soviet patriarchy, like very controversially like patriarchy and matriarchate were kind of two oppressive system that were um, existing to, uh, parallel in the Soviet Union. Um, again another participant of the of the uh, women worker woman worker exhibition, Irina Nahava. Uh, she, uh, after that exhibition, I think for the whole decade, she was creating, uh, she was producing quite big, quite large body of uh, feminist works. This work, Big Red, is a sculpture made out of um, parachute silk. It was laid quietly on, and deflated on the floor of the gallery, but when the uh, guest was entering the gallery, it started to inflate, pointing, pointing out all its Phallic elements. Uh, another work uh, says, "Please stay. Please stay alone." This is uh, actually it's uh, this work is 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 funny. It's hilarious. It's kind of hilarious, but it refers to quite sad subject of maternal love. When um, when the spectator enters the, uh, this uh, installation. First, they feel very warm and comfortable and cozy, but then the structure starts, again made out of parachute silk, starts to inflate, squeezing the, uh, the person inside it and suffocating it, and kind of, and uh, and uh, they they hear the voice, stay alone, please stay alone, don't don't leave. So uh, at some point, the uh, viewer, well, the person inside, can't. Think about anything else rather to be alone again. The last chapter called How I Became an Artist. How I Became an Artist is a title of um, one of the publications uh, organized by Vadim ed and edited by Vadim Zahar called Post. This is number six of, of Post called how I became an artist. There are 34 entr entries into, into this publication uh, on all, all answering this question, how I became an artist. Two of texts are written 
by women. Uh, both texts are quite, quite ironic. Uh, so one of the texts is written by Maria Chukova, and all the text is about cooking. So answer the question how it became the artist. She tells how she learned how to cook for big, for large groups of people. Uh, she shares recipes. She describes events when she uh, when she was feeding people. So it's all it's all about cooking, cooking, and uh, she uh, pretends that she started to draw recipes because she didn't speak foreign languages, but wanted to share her recipes with international community of creators. So she started to draw this highly collectible uh, artworks that she still draws. They just such beautiful pieces. Um, and uh, this is the documentation of one of the performances. She was basically very, very uh, kind of, uh, known in Moscow in the 1990s by her uh, performances where she was practically cooking for people, inviting them, uh, inviting people in the gallery just to have some soup or have some dumplings. This is um, a documentation of performance uh, in Petrovich Club in Moscow in 2002. Chukova organized a competition of dumplings making between different uh, female celebrities, artists, musicians, models. The condition, condition of participation was that the um, competitors, uh, women, competitive women, should uh, uh, come wearing dressing gown and uh, wearing curls on their hair. And this is uh, here, uh, Chukov plays with stereotype of um, Soviet uh, housewife. Well, it wasn't exactly housewife because all women are working. But interestingly, that Tatiana Goricheva uh, writes quite angrily about this stereotype of Soviet woman in her interview to Gevta. She says that a uh, uh, typical Soviet wife looks submissive. She wears a dressing gown and curls at her home as a uniform and meet her husband with a shot of vodka and plate of herring and seduces him. And at the same time, she is the one who does all work and makes decisions. Gorichev calls um, it a model of an ideal woman, but a very negative model. And she hails it like joyless matriarchate. So Chukova's theater of affective labor explores this joyless matriarchate in quite joyful, actually, and cunning way. Another entry to the uh, journal, uh, How I Became an Artist, was written by uh, Larissa Zvidachotin. <coughs> on, right, on the big photograph on the right, uh, in the group of um, artists uh, came, um, who came to, to Moscow from Odessa and became uh, part of the circles. circles. Uh, and on the small photograph, <coughs> they see her behind, uh, behind um, her husband, Zvizda uh, Chotov, uh, who um, who showing his work, Konstantin Zvizda Chotov, showing um, his work. Her text is all about breaking the rules. She writes how from the very, her very childhood, she was breaking the rules and doing not exactly opposite to what she was told, told to do. These are the works by um, uh, Larissa Svestanchotova. She appropriated the uh, kind of long culture uh, um, <coughs> style decorations that adorned uh, um, flats, uh, communal, mostly communal flats in, in the Soviet Union and turn them, turn them into, into her own artworks. Uh, the, this is the work of early 90s, called Plaster. This work ruminates on, uh, reflects on uh, emerging uh, industry of advertisement in, in 
of Soviet Russia. Uh, we, we know that in, Soviet, in the Soviet Union, there were no advertisements uh, on Soviet towns. So uh, Soviet citizens never saw like naked female figures on the billboards as, as uh, it became so typical in the 1990s. In the 1990s, the advertisement industry kind of flood the cities with billboards. There were enormous amount of billboards and so many of them were exploiting the image of young female naked or semi-naked body. So uh, Zvezda Chotova made this ironic remark on, on it, uh, on this advert. He put a male uh, naked body on the advert decorated by very naive uh, Flowers, plastic flowers and decoration, and this young, beautiful male um, actually advertises plaster that mostly uses by women of, of, of certain age. So she uh, she plays, she kind of protests against, against this, uh, this uh, liberalism, basically, that, that flooded the city, cities, uh, the streets of Moscow. And the cities of Russia. So these were the works by women artists I wanted to show you today. We went more or less chronologically through the history of Moscow conceptualism uh, from 1970s to early 1990s and projected almost to, uh, uh, to 2000. We stopped on the first feminist exhibition that opened a rich and vibrant succession of feminist exhibitions of 1990s in Russia. We are not talking about them today. Um, we, stopped, uh, we stopped at the beginning of 90s, the years uh, which was full of hopes that Russia will be liberated from the totalitarian past into a new freedom. And we saw the works by female artists who resisted not only the late Soviet regime, but also the ideology neoliberalism of neoliberalism that was emerging in Russia in the 1990s. As Olivia Lang put in the introduction to her funny weather, what I care about more in art is resistance and repair. Resistance and repair, I think that being particularly, particularly important for practically every work I will show you today. To wrap it up and to, before we come to the questions, I would like to show you a very small collection of works made today, in, in, very recently, which somehow relate to this narrative. I wouldn't comment, I just made very few explanations just to make clear what it is. So this is the work by Ilya and Emilia Kovakov, How to Meet an Angel on the Walls of of our contemporary art museum in Berlin in 2019. Uh, Olga Chernyshova, Untitled, Escalation, 2015. Maria Somnina in installation by Marina Alexeyeva Vladimirka. Uh, this is 3D uh, reconstruction of very famous work by Russian uh, artist of landscape uh, is Isaac Levitan, which, which shows the uh, road Vladimirka, which was the road to Siberia, the, the road to Gunung. Uh, this reconstruction is actually made uh, in the participation of Vladimir Sarokin. <coughs> this is uh, the steel from uh, the documentation of Irina Nahava's very latest work, 2021. I think it was accomplished last autumn. It's called the history of uh, Golubitskaya. Golubitskaya is uh, a town not far from Kiev, where uh, Anna Tarshis lived on Azov, Azov Sea. Uh, Nakhova created the fake, uh, like the fictional, the fictional uh, folk, the, the fictional history of this um, this place. And here, this is part of her uh, large size specific installation. This is a black square. Uh, with um, with hexagrams of a book, um, Chinese book of changes. 
And if you read the, this hexagram, uh, this, they, they can, this, what they say, describe last nine years of political changes in Russia in quite different you know, in words of euphemism. And the last work by Olga Bashko, it's called On Crossroads, by uh, efforts of uh, creator Andrei Yerofeev. It was put in the Radio Park quite close to Kremlin, very close proximity to Kremlin, and it shows a digital remote control uh, buttons uh, cut in stone. So basically, no, there's no choice, no changes. Um, yeah, so this is the last work of this beautiful Moscow skies that I wanted to show you today. <laughs> Thank you very much. And if you have <laughs>